Hello everyone, Dr. David Ajibari here, and welcome to your health in your hands. I'm with the Brain and Body Foundation, like you all know, and um, some of you don't realize this, but many, many years ago, uh, when we started doing the clinic, the Friday clinics, you can go to, go to our clinic, and then uh, you would see me or one of my staff, and we would take you through and provide you with um, supplements and nutraceuticals to help with your child's brain dis disorders. Well, Again, many of you don't know this. Some of you are watching and you've been beneficiaries of the foundation. But many years we used to go, we used to have these small bottles of omega-3s, which each bottle, by the way, we, we cost about 25,000 naira. And we, would, we had tons of these. And we would go to the national hospital, we would go to the hospitals in, in Abuja and give them feed out to kids who had things, brain disorders like cerebral palsies, um, seizures, Down syndrome, and all that. And over and over again, these people would come back to us and ask for more because they were seeing significant results. And so we would give them more. And after a while, we started recording these things, like you know. And the results were remarkable. Um, and we probably will explain some of these things as we go along. But the brain needs omega 3s. And we've explained this a few times. The brain needs omega threes, and the more, the higher the quality of the omega threes, the better it will work for you. And so we started taking. We even took to the military hospitals and to give to the soldiers with PTSD or who are having mood disorders, and they started improving too. So I was like, oh, we are onto something. Now I say all this to say this: the company and the organization that was providing these for us, free of charge, by the way, and we gave them to you free of charge, like you know, is our guest, the head of that company is our guest today, Dr. Barry Sears. Hello, Dr. Sears. David, how are you? I am well. How are you? Very good, thank you. I can't tell you what an honor it is to finally have you on our show. And um, as you know, you, you've been a mentor and a friend to me and a great supporter of the foundation, supporter of the foundation. So. I don't take this opportunity to say thank you. Thank oh, it's you. been my pleasure. You're doing great work. Thank you. Thank you so much. So please, can you tell us a little bit about you and what some of the interesting things you're doing in the world? I know you've started a new company again, but let's hear what you've been doing for the past, you know, 40 years. Or so. well, uh, well, we'll give you the, the quick story. Uh, yeah. Really, the, uh, the last 40 years, I've been uh, trying to address a really an underlying question about medicine. Uh, is the goal of medicine to uh, treat the symptoms of chronic disease, or is it the goal of medicine to basically heal the injuries? The, ask, the question is saying, uh, is our goal to basically understand how the body heals itself? Because once you can crack that code, and it's a very complex code, you usher in a whole new era of medicine. Mm -hmm. Not a really a new era, because this is what Hippocrates said 2,500 years ago. He said the goal of medicine is to prevent disease. If you can't prevent disease, at least cure the disease. Mm. Okay, if you can't cure the disease, at least reduce the pain. So some 2,500 years later, how do we practice medicine? We're trying to reduce the pain. So we're not asking of how to prevent disease. It's really saying, how can we get the body to heal itself? The body is a remarkable engine. But like any engine, you have to give it the right fuel. This is the food we eat in the right proportions. And in doing so, you can take this miraculous uh, uh, engine of our body and basically fast forward the healing process. Wait a so minute, Doc. Wait a minute. I, I got I to stop here. Um, food? Did you just say food? Yes. To food. heal the body? Because uh, th think about uh, people talk about metabolism. They say, what's metabolism? I said, here's a good short answer. You put dead things into your mouth and the body miraculously turns it into new living tissue. Mm -hmm. That's pretty close to a miracle in my book. And so it's under, understanding that the mysteries of metabolism, they're, they're incredibly complex, of less, a little less complex 40 years now than they were 40 years ago, but it's how the food we eat controls our hormones, and the expression of our genes. Mm. And if we can crack that code, we have basically the secrets to healing. And mm. that becomes really the focus of medicine in the future, how to get the body, this remarkable machine, 
the hero itself. Mm. Mm. And what are some of the things you've discovered in the, along this process? I know you've started the Zone Lab. I know you've uh, you started the inflammation, the Anti-Inflammation Institute. Well, all that revolve, revolves revolves around. Uh, there's two sides of um, we think of you know many diseases which are associated with inflammation. But there's two sides to inflammation. There's the turning on, but also the turning off. I think of this as a sink that has a, a, a blockage in the drain. You turn the faucet on. What happens? The levels of the water build up in the sink, and then mm -hmm. they start spilling over onto the floor. We call that disease. Mm -hmm. They say, oh my God, what are we going to do? I say, first step, take care of the blockage in the sink. That's the resolution. So the resolution aspect of the inflammatory response, this is under very exceptionally profound dietary control. But the door can swing both ways. Your diet can basically enhance the resolution response or it can block it. And what we have now on a worldwide basis is changes in dietary patterns are significantly basically blocking that resolution response. Mm -hmm. So in your experience with the omega-3 fatty acids, which is only one part of the total puzzle, say, if I can basically get enough omega-3 fatty acids into the patient, the body, in this case, the brain, begins to heal itself. Mm -hmm. And so if you tell, tell well, basically relate uh, to individuals the stories you have seen with your own hands, say, that can't be done. It's impossible. Say, but I've seen it. Uh, say, I have two eyes. I'm just reporting back what I see. It, can, it can't, can't be this simple. What's going on in the body is incredibly complex. And basically, there's the problem. What seems to be simple is complex. But once you understand the keys to how to use food as a drug, we go back to Hippocrates. That's what he also said. Treat your food as medicine. Treat your medicine as food. It's taken us 2,500 years to understand his wisdom in terms of new uh, understandings of how food affects our hormones and how it affects the expression of our genes. And if you do this correctly, you can get the body to heal the damage caused by the injury. That is amazing. That is amazing. Food as a drug, what a concept. Well, I'm going to, take a, we're going to have to take a quick short break here, Dr. Sears, and then we will be right back. So folks, do not go away. <laughs> All right, folks, welcome back. We are talking about inflammation. We're talking about the new concept of f food as a drug with Dr. Barry Sears, who is the founder of the Inflammation Research Center and the Zone Labs and... Sinotech Foods. Sinotech Foods, and we'll get that information later on. But, uh, Doc, so we're looking at this COVID-19 now. We've gone over a year into it, and uh, people talk about... We're seeing patterns, right? So comorbidities, if you're older, if you have hypertension, if you have diabetes, if you're a man, <laughs> if you're type, a blood type thing. But I can't help but think that these don't really paint the, the deeper picture. What is the common denominator? What is it that is common to all these people, all these individuals that makes them more prone to having more severe forms of COVID-19 and dying from COVID-19. What are your they're thoughts? All, the common denominator is they're all inflamed. The complications, the complications of COVID-19 are due to basically an overproduction of inflammatory mediators. Now we think of inflammation as, oh, that's the bad guy. Well, if we had no inflammation, we would not survive in this world. Mm -hmm. Without inflammation, we'd be a sitting target for microbes. Without inflammation, our physical injuries would never heal. But we had to turn it on, but then we had to turn it off. That's the other part of inflammation, the resolution. So we had to ask the question, not why people basically uh, die of COVID-19, but why do many of the people, especially in America, 80% uh, of the people, 40% never have any symptoms whatsoever. Another 40% of their symptoms are so mild, they just don't even recognize it. 20% uh, now will have severe, saying something's wrong. Perhaps half of that will go to the hospital, 
and of the ones who go to the hospital, about half will die. What's the common denominator? Excess inflammation. It's not that basically the COVID-19 is causing inflammation. That's how the body attacks it. Mm -hmm. But the body is unable to turn off the inflammation. Mm -hmm. Then you get what's called the cytokine storm. And everything basically falls apart. So our goal is saying, we can look at COVID-19 and the complications of saying, it's really a disease of a blockage of the body's internal resolution response. That's how we heal. And when it's blocked, nothing heals correctly. That's why now we can look back at many diseases which are linked to inflammation and say, yes, we can see the inflammation, but we can't see the blockage of the resolution response that turns off the inflammation to set the stage for the body to heal itself. Hmm. So what you're saying is that, and if I may get this right, people's quote unquote food, the dietary lifestyles, the physical lifestyles, maybe even their genes, make them more have a higher level of inflammation in their bodies, which sets the stage for a more severe form of COVID-19 should they acquire, should they get contra contract the virus. Exactly. And what, what's the easiest way to find out if you're inflamed? Test. I'm sure. No, no. The easiest way, go to a mirror, take all your clothes off and ask to say, do I look fat? <laughs> <laughs> and we all know what that means. I, okay. I, I'm, I'll by myself say, no, I'm, I think I'm fat. If you're fat, that means you're already inflamed. Because your fat stores, excess fat stores, are the breeding ground for inflammation. Mm. And that's why the, the number one predictor of complications of COVID-19 are obesity and age. Mm. Why age? Because as we age, the body becomes more inflamed. Mm. And so all the complications of aging that we talk about are really complications caused by inflammation, but in reality caused by a blockage of the body's natural ability to resolve inflammation and heal. Mm. And so when you begin to look at this thing, all of a sudden medicine is not that complex. Well, we've wanted to say, it's a very arcane say we have a drug A for disease Z. No, we just have to basically get the body to basically optimize the resolution response, which is under profound dietary control. Mm. Most people say, oh, but that sounds so boring. What's boring is being in a hospital on a ventilator. That's right. But, but the fact is, you know, the data is quite clear. Actually, the, the most recent studies came out only about a week ago to say those who had higher levels of, of inflammation in their blood, you know, about a 90% greater chance of dying from COVID-19, all things being equal. You, that's, a, that's a paper that came out recently? Yes, yes. Oh, I need to have that paper. We'll, we'll probably get that and probably publish it on our, on our, put it on our I'll, website. I'll, I'll, I'll send the copies to you. And right, so, uh, so again, showing very clearly in the paper that as you reduce the or increase the levels of these omega-3 fatty acids in your blood, mortality goes down dramatically. Hmm. Now, is that all you can do? Oh, you can do far more. And, but the, the far more is, again, these other aspects of the diet which is almost like a, a combination lock. Mm -hmm. A combination lock, you have to turn to the left, to the right number, then to the right, to the right number, and then back to the left, to the right number. And if you do, magically, the lock opens. But what if you have one of those numbers missing? Mm -hmm. The lock's not going to open. Right. And so we're really looking at food as is really a combination therapy. Like in cancer, we never use a single drug in cancer. That's right. You use multiple drugs. Likewise, you're using multiple food components because each one has within it the ability to basically change the hormones and more importantly, change the expression of our genes that opens that combination lock to allow us to go in and basically reprogram the body's immune system. That is huge. That is huge. Uh, folks, we will be right back after this short break. And Doc, we want to also talk about how does... I, from what we're talking about, it's like, I'm thinking in my mind, okay, how do we break this down? How do we make this available in a quote unquote third world setting? Because we're not, most people are not going to have, be able to have access to such high tech food, 
food drugs as as you do over there, but I'm sure there'll be some ways that we can break it down and make uh, some things that we can apply in our setting. So we will be right back, folks. All right, folks, welcome back. We are having a fascinating discussion with Dr. Sears about inflammation and what you can do. So, Doc, all this sounds great. What is the practicality? How do we bring it down to our level? Well, it basically, uh, uh, your great-grandmother probably gave you all the information you needed. Really? How to follow this lifestyle. Uh, she said really th three things. Uh, one, you never leave the table until you eat all your vegetables. Boring, boring, <laughs> but it works. And there's a, a, a number of reasons why. Second, eat only enough food uh, that you need, not more. Three, uh, through all of Europe uh, in the, uh, the early part of the 20th century, and probably through most of the world, no child could leave the house unless they had a tablespoon of cod liver oil. Mm. So mm. all of a sudden, you say, your grandmother gave you all the rules of how to optimize this resolution response. Let's go through each one. Why? Uh, first of all, why do you eat your vegetables? Well, one, is hard to overconsume them. It's very easy to overconsume a processed food, but eating vegetables, that's hard work. And as a consequence, you're not putting as much inflammation in the body as the body has to basically cause inflammation, oxidative stress, to try to process excess calories coming in. How do you know you're eating too many calories? You're fat. Right. And, and, and we, we eat a lot of starchy foods, Doc, in, in Nigeria and West Africa. A lot of really starchy foods. So that's a big problem because that converts. It, it's a problem, but, but nonetheless, it's, the problem is, again, the convenience. What has happened in uh, you know, the Western world and now going worldwide, the convenience. Mm -hmm. Convenience foods because they're, they are convenient. And so we have seen changes in the food of chain dramatically. Greater use of sugars. That's the cheapest ingredient uh, known to man. Greater use of vegetable oils. Mm. That's the that's second cheapest ingredient known to mankind. Mm. Now, the food industry can make those two into virtually anything. But those two are a deadly combination to increase inflammation. Mm. And now, why the vegetables? Said, first of all, it's hard to overeat them. Second, they contain chemicals called polyphenols. These are the chemicals that give the fruit and color, uh, or the fruits and vegetables, their color. That's all we thought they did for thousands of years. We now they knew, do far more. They're powerful tools to change gene expression, but you have to eat enough. Mm -hmm. So if you're not eating a lot of colorful fruits and vegetables, you're not getting enough polyphenols. So you're already deficient in one of the keys of that combination lock I've talked about. And that, and that, those fruits and vegetables, vegetables especially, have to be uncooked for the most part, right? Oh, well, they, actually, they have to be cooked because basically the cooking uh, actually unleashes and uh, releases the polyphenols. It's very Isn't hard to eat. Excuse Doesn't me. Does it them too? It depends on how high you cook. Ah. And so again, it's the, the, they are temperature sensitive, but not that temperature sensitive. Okay. So again, of uh, a simple, basically making almost a, a soup-like basis. Not putting on, uh, you know, uh, uh, a supercharge uh, at 500 degrees, maybe at, at, you know, you know, 100 degrees centigrade. That's how you make soup, the old-fashioned way. We we don't we don't have those thermometers, dog. We just put them on a on a, fi on a fire out in the open and just put a pot and, there. And <laughs> so, but but again, we that's, that's fire basically again it breaks down the structure to allow us to absorb them more effectively. Okay. So that that's one part of our combination lock, getting right. a lot more vegetables. And in Africa, that's not hard. It's just basically people don't eat, eat as much because it's more convenient to basically eat processed foods. Mm -hmm. so, second of all, we talked about the cod liver oil, the world's most disgusting food known to man. Yeah. But it's rich in the omega-3 fatty acids. Mm -hmm. the, the fatty acids that uh, we supply you for the, the brain patients are just much more highly purified and much more concentrated. Right. But cod liver oil... Uh, is a good source of these omega-3 fatty acids. So having a tablespoon a day of cod liver oil, disgusting as it is, is one way of getting adequate levels. Another way is eating fatty fish. Now, again, and the last aspect is controlling your diet. 
It's not saying, oh, I, I can't stop eating. I'm addicted to food. There's two parts to basically appetite. There's the hormones that turn it on and the hormones that turn it off. So we want to get more of the hormones uh, being made that turn off appetite so you don't overconsume food. For that, you need a balance of protein and carbohydrate. Where do you get your carbohydrates from? Fruits and vegetables. You set the balance it off with protein at every meal. And how do you know it's working? Your watch will tell you. You won't be hungry for the next five hours. Mm. I say, well, that doesn't sound very high tech. It isn't until you understand the molecular biology of each of those components of that combination lock I just explained. Mm. Do it, do it on a routine basis. That lock opens at every meal. And with that lock opening, you're now in a position to optimize that resolution response and optimize the body's ability to turn off inflammation and repair and regenerate the damage caused by it. Mm. Mm. No, high te- no high tech medicine required, but it is required a, basically a commitment to basically be aware of the food you're eating every time you put it into your mouth. Mm. People say, oh, I don't have time. I got, you know, I've got uh, my friends to call on the internet and I've got some video games to play saying, you're missing right. the point <laughs> that the fact is just plan your day out around the foods you like to eat, adjust them. And how do you know they're adjusting right? You're never hungry. If you're never hungry, say you've got the keys of the kingdom. Mm. Mm. That is interesting. It's, and it seems simple enough, but it takes some discipline. But, but this is for if, you know, keeping things in equilibrium. What if things become overwhelming, for instance, uh, they are diabetic, uh, hypertensive? I would think that you would require more firepower than that. that actually, that's the fire, all the firepower you need. Really? Now, you can, you, can, you can concentrate up those key ingredients. The key ingredients are the polyphenols, mm-hmm. the omega-3 fatty acids, and the balance of protein to carbohydrate. Uh, you can basically get them a little more high tech. But again, if you have a chronic disease, such as diabetes, mm-hmm. type 2 diabetes in particular, is it reversible? Yes, it is. Really? Uh, is a hypertension rever- reversible? Yes, it is. Yes. But, but again, it's not by reversible by taking drugs. That's basically like um, putting a Band-Aid over a wound. You want to mm-hmm. heal the wound. The wound is the body's resolution response is being blocked. And so so there's where I want to put my attention in medicine, how to get the patient with the least effort on their part to unblock that natural healing response. And and the science behind it is incredibly complex. Uh, There's just a a really a a few people at Harvard Medical School can even begin to understand all the nuances because Mm -hmm. we tend in medicine to focus on the minutia. We very rarely stand back and now we look at the, we look at the leaf not not only the treatment, but we really want to look at the forest. And then all of a sudden, you see things emerging out of this. This makes common sense. This basically changes how we practice medicine, not to basically treat the symptoms of disease, but to cure the disease and basically prevent the disease. Disease is simply the body's inability to repair the damage caused by an injury. Uh, COVID-19 is an injury. It's a micro, it's a viral infection. Uh, you know, breaking your arm is an injury. Getting a heart disease is basically an internal injury. Mm-hmm. So these are all injuries. And the first thing they do, they cause inflammation. Mm-hmm. And once you learn the, the rules of the road of how to turn off the inflammation, you need some. But if you don't turn it off, it basically keeps attacking the body and eventually causes the chronic disease. Then say, now I'll go to the uh, pharmacy and they say, give me a drug to take the rest of my life to try to treat the symptoms. No drug cures disease. They treat the symptoms and they don't treat them very well because what happens after a couple of years, it starts not to work very well. So they give you a second drug and a third and a fourth. And pretty soon you're making the, uh, you know, American drug companies filthy rich. <laughs> Too bad we don't have much shares in them. <laughs> but but th- this why it's basically it's a it's a technology that's applicable on a worldwide basis and inexpensive. 
Now you're right. You know, say in the in the brain patients you deal with, they need very high levels. Uh, so they might have to take, oh, not a tablespoon of cod liver oil, but um, maybe a gallon. Say, so that's not going to happen. So yeah. that's why we, uh, we send you the highly concentrated materials that they can get the high levels to get really a, a rescue action to basically uh, be stop stop the inflammation and start the healing process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this information. Folks, this recordings will be available on the NTA website and on, of course, on our website, brainandbodyfoundation.org. I suggest you go back and watch this. You send them to your physicians, to your psychiatrists, your neurosurgeons, your neurologists, everybody, because this is I mean, third world countries where we're in. We need all the help we can get. And um, understanding how your body is affected by the food you eat and how your food, the food you eat can improve your health is uh, absolutely important. And I, I think one of the good things about COVID-19, uh, Doc, I mean, if we can call it a good thing, is, it, is that it's opened people's ears to begin to listen to some of these health principles in a way that they haven't before. I mean, we've been doing this for years, but now people are now actually watching to forget, watching more than ever to get this health information. So um, I hope they take it to heart. Well, and again, we, we have the ability basically to control COVID-19 very effectively. Hmm. The question is, do we treat? No. Food. And the reason Food. why? Because if your resolution response is blocked, the vaccines will not work very well. Hmm. This is well known in terms of influenza vaccines. That hmm. of if you give a, a lean individual and an obese individual the same vaccine, they'll make antibodies, but they'll only be half as effective in the obese individual. Why? Really? Because the residual inflammation is causing disruptions in the body's immune response. Interesting. So it goes back to the basics. <laughs> it, it, it hasn't changed in about 200,000 years. It probably won't change tomorrow. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sears, for this for this time. Uh, this is invaluable, I have to say. So um, hopefully we can get you back on and talk about something. By all that. means. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Folks, thanks for joining us, and we will see you again next week. In the meantime, stay safe. God bless. Take care.